Tiffany and I met, well, at, her son Oscar was in fifth grade and he's 23 now. Yes. So a long darn time ago. And um, I came to teach, I teach kids with emotional behavioral disabilities. So I teach those really naughty kids. How many of you do that? Work with those kids? Okay. Um, how many of you know those kids? Right. Um, so I came to teaching from a very sort of different route. I was alternately certified. Um, and prior to <coughs> teaching, I had run group homes for people with autism and I'd worked in um, workshops and things like that for people with severe disabilities. But in that lifetime, in that life, that career, I was trained as a behaviorist. So I'm going to I'm going to let you know right now that I think we're missing a piece when it comes to how to deal with some of our more troubled kids. And that is a really good basic understanding of behavior. Behavior as a science. Behavior as a clinical reality. Now, we can't only be working in that mode. We have to also be looking at the child as a whole, as a real person, as somebody with feelings, and all of those other things. Who feels like Maybe they could use more information about behavior and how to handle behavior. I agree. I think we all could. I could. Everybody could. But there, there is a set and proven way of dealing with behavior. And I was using that in these other settings. And then my husband, who is a corporate guy, and he you know, makes real good money when he's working, but there are times when you know, the economy's down or something like that, and his, his type of position as strategic planner is the first one to go. So one of those downtimes. I had been at home for a few years with four kids, and um, he wasn't working, so I decided to substitute teach. And my first job was in a classroom for kids with severe behavior issues. And I came home and I said, I don't care if you win the lottery tomorrow, this is what I want to do. Which is a little weird, right? <laughs> because they were calling me a crack whore, and I was like, oh, I love it! <laughs> and honestly, <laughs> I've never been a crack whore. I still was like, this is a cool place. And the reason I loved it was, honest, I haven't. Um, the reason I loved it was, here I had this set of information that working with people with severe autism or severe other disabilities, cognitive issues, could only make very moderate gains. But I saw this whole new population of kids, but also of parents, who could make huge gains with the information that I had from this other weird world. So I did that for a few years, and after a few years, I started at a new neighborhood school in our inner city in Racine, and it was my first year at that school when I did my typical beginning of the school year thing. And at the beginning of the school year, every year, I look through those IEPs, and I see what those kiddos are coming to me looking like, and I make phone calls before I even see the kids. I make phone calls to the parents. And so I looked at Oscar's file, and it said he was on a reduced schedule. I had heard through the school that Tiffany was a big problem. They were right. Um, <laughs> and that Oscar was an even bigger problem, and they were wrong. The problem was not with Oscar. It was with the way people in that building were, were attending to his behavior. He was getting reinforced for a lot of bad stuff and he wasn't getting reinforced for any of the good stuff. We see that happen all the time, don't we? All right, so I called Tiffany and I said, is this Mrs. Stevenson? And she said, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I said, hi, this is Mrs. D. Um, I wanted to talk to you about Oscar. And you know, I said, I'm really looking forward to working with him. And I heard, did they tell you about Oscar? And I said, well, I read, and yeah, people told me, but I see he runs home, and I see he's on a reduced schedule, and here's the thing. If your boy is going to run home every day, I can't teach him. But I know how to handle behavior, so if we can just keep his little butt in school, I can handle the rest of the behaviors. Will you help me? She said, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I said, okay, so here's the plan. The first time he runs out the door, you're going to walk his butt back to school. He's going to sit in the class, and I'm going to handle whatever happens after that. And I felt very confident that I could do that. Um, and to her credit, what'd you do? <laughs> okay, so I want to tell my little version of that first phone call. <laughs> Two sides to every story. Listen, I hate the way so, she. Um, <laughs> I hate the way she does my voice. 
I, I'm going to try to be nice when I do a Miss D. So I'm at home cleaning, and it's summertime, okay? So the last thing I'm looking for is a, a phone call from a white teacher. Ooh. Phone rings. Hello. Yes, hi, this is Miss D. I'm calling, looking for the mother of Oscar Wells. This is Tiffany. Like, what you want? <laughs> So she tells me her plan. I'm like, mm-hmm, yeah, right. In my mind, that's what's going on. Like, here come another one. Because I done set an IEP after IEP, and each year, and nothing changes. So I just agree with the white teacher, because they don't want to hear from the black mama. Because this is my child. I know my child. So when Miss D said, what I bring, my, when I asked, did you hear about Oscar? Like, did you hear the things they're saying? Because I hear the things they're saying about my son. And I know who my son is. And he is not what's on that IEP paper. What Anita didn't know, my son from kindergarten, his kindergarten teacher, who was Hispanic, Hispanic, you know, I'm doing us. <laughs> <laughs> so I do know, I'm gonna tell you guys, I do know proper grammar, but for, the sake of getting to know the black mama allow me to be me for just a little bit. And then I'll come back to the author that I am. <laughs> so Oscar was placed in an IEP in kindergarten. And at that time, I was not as educated as I am today. So when they explained to me, this is an individual program for um, his education, I was like, OK. So I'm thinking, my son's special. He, he gonna get to do things himself, you know, like, oh, he got his own little thing. Not understanding what that individual education program was really what it was. So when they told me my son was strong-willed, I'm thinking he's strong, willing to learn, because my son, in his mind, he has a strong mind. And they, they could have just told me, your son is stubborn. <laughs> he's not gonna do things. So first of all, there was a, communication that wasn't being, you were saying one thing, I was hearing another, we're not clicking. You, you see that? So that's one thing we need to work on, is we say things with, with different meanings. If I say there, there, how you spell it? Go over there and the kid might write T-H-E-I-R. That's not correct. But um, Ms. D said something powerful. She said, if your son come home, will you bring him back? I said to her, if you're willing to teach him, I will bring him back. Because what I found is by my son being on a reduced schedule, they didn't want to teach him. They did not want to teach him. And you'll find in my book, I'm my child's first teacher. So when they sent him home, it wasn't no video games. It was OK. Now, you done had gym art. <laughs> I'm for real. You done had gym art and music class. Let's get to the math. Let's get to the science. So, you know, I would take him into my kitchen. We would do things at home. Sometimes when you have parents um, with kids with behaviors, you can do some ideas. You know, um, your stove could work as a Bonson burger. You burn it. You know, use the things. Hey, when you're chopping up your sweet potatoes, have your kid. Recognize the shape, recognize the color, count how many. Use your parenting skills as a teaching opportunity. That's one thing I would ask that you so tell Tim, your teachers. Were you surprised when I called you? I was very surprised because it was not a negative thing. What you about when I saying? called you the first time? That's what I'm talking about. Oh, the first okay. time when you called me during my summer, I just knew. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, friend, I mean the first time I called when Oscar was misbehaving. Oh, now, when school started, school started, I sent my son to school, and I did get a phone call. And that day, I was feeling good. <laughs> I was feeling good. And um, I'm, I'm cleaning my dishes and starting dinner at, in the morning. I'm starting dinner. I'm, I'm happy now. My kids in school, my husband at work, I got the house to myself, yay. <laughs> and I get a phone call. And Miss D say, uh, he's on his way home. I was like, okay, hung up, I just stopped cleaning. What did you cleaning. think at first though, when I first when called When she you? first called, um, 
I was like, oh my goodness, what the heck? Heck ain't the word I use. What the <laughs> heck did this boy done did now, you know? And, and I really thought she was going to say, you know, maybe you should just keep, because now she done got to me, ask. <laughs> maybe you should keep her home. But she was very serious about teaching my child, and I was very serious about my son's education. I was, I've always been. And so Oscar was surprised because, y'all see me, I'm big mama. I walked him. <laughs> he caught the bus to school. But yes, I did. I told her I would walk him back. If he come home, I would walk him back. And her class was on the second floor. But I did. I, took <laughs> I walked his little tail. You gonna come in here? And you know, I I'm gonna say this, as a student, as a student, that's what my dad, when I got to middle school, I was in seventh grade, science class, cutting up, love to talk, love to talk. Teacher interrupted, interrupted, every rework I interrupted. Um, so my dad came and sat with me. He sat right next to me in science class. Well, I ain't talking no more. Mm -mm, teacher didn't have so, no problems. So Tiffany did what she agreed to do, right? which was awesome. And I did what I agreed to do which was awesome. And that's the baseline. That's the, that's the base on which you build everything else. And if she hadn't been able to do it that day, I would have tried again. Because maybe one of the babies would have been sick, or maybe she you know, just couldn't get out of the house, or maybe I would have given her a chance again. I wouldn't write it off just because, because we know there are all sorts of realities, especially if you're living in poverty, that can interfere with your desire to do well. So one of the things we want to share today is the notion that I always tell Tiffany, there, everybody that I, that when I do trainings on behaviorism, my first thing I say is there are no bad kids. I honestly believe that. There are kids who have really awful behaviors that are working for them for some reason. I also try to look at it, and this is hard for us because we want to protect these little babies. I also always try to look at it as there are no bad parents. And honestly, from the first time I, I started working in this field, I've never met a parent, no matter how um, lacking in resources or understanding, who didn't want what was best for their kid. Right. I've never met a parent who didn't care if their kids succeeded. Now, I've met some loud, angry, upset, frustrated, ready to qu Her name's Tiffany. Um, <laughs> I met a lot of those parents, but coming at them with a different approach, with an understanding and a vision that they might actually be somebody who we didn't get to in school, who we weren't able to help, who now are trying to do the things that they, they missed out on the part that they were supposed to get when they were young. They're trying to do this and we're, we're compounding that problem, but not because they're bad people. And that's, I do public speaking for this, um, Foster camp, it's a camp for kids with foster, who are in foster care. It's really a lovely camp. And it's so funny because those, those people who take care of these foster care babies have such a hard time looking at parents as just grown versions of those kids. And that's what I'm kind of asking all of us to do. Um, so I have four kids, she has eight kids. Between, between us there's 12 kids, math. And <laughs> our goal today is to kind of you know, recognize that we're, we're in both roles. Tiffany works in, capa in a capacity as a teacher when she does Sunday school and she does some other things and she's at also in school for becoming a teacher. And um, yay, <laughs> Tiffany! <laughs> so we've got multiple roles that each one of us take and that's important to understand um, that our perspective is kind of going in and out of those roles as parent and, and teacher. Um, but our goal today is to share parts of our story to increase, we're not sharing it all because you gotta buy the book. Um, That's right. to increase understanding between parents and teachers. And the reason for that goal is because that's, that is the best way. It's not the only way, but it's the best, most effective, quickest way to help these kids who we're working with who are really in need. Um, so our story from there gets a little crazy um, because my world is very different from Tiffany's world. Yes. And our two worlds had to come together. Um, the, the good news is Oscar did great that year. And there's, all, there's a lot of that detail. It wasn't easy at the beginning, but by the end he was doing great. And Tiffany invited my family to her son's 
fifth grade graduation party. And I knew where Tiffany lived. Tiffany lives in the hood. Right, Tiff? Near to school. Okay. That's not politically correct, but it's the truth. That's is where she truth? lived. She lived in a place that I would not, and that's one of our things, is that we're very honest about these perceptions and these differences. And so when she invited my family, all my kids were going to private school. We were, you know, we we're upper middle class or middle class. And Tiffany was living in poverty and living in a different area. So she invited me with an open heart and excitement over all the success we had had as a partner to come with my family to her house. So I know this doesn't reflect well on me. You guys, I get it. <laughs> but I was like, um, OK. I just, in my mind, I thought, we work too hard together. I can't say no. So I went home and I told my family, we're, we'll be going to a party in, in a particular neighborhood. And, I want, and all I said to my kids, who were very little at the time, was please, please, please be gracious, because this woman means a lot to me and her son means the world to me. So it's going to be different. It's not going to be the same environment that you're used to. It's not going to be a party like you're used to. But please, please, please be gracious, because these people matter to me. And my husband, when I asked him, was like, yeah, we're going. Of course we're going. If this kid's working that hard in school, we're going to be there. So. Right away, those differences started to show. You want to just share one thing from the part? Trust me, beginning to end, this party was a clash of cultures. <laughs> but but in, in um, humor and love and understanding, yes. we've been able to kind of talk about those things. And if we don't talk about those things, we can't address them. So you, please don't think too badly of me. I'm telling you the truth about myself, and I've grown as a person. Yes. Um, <laughs> And you'll see, I too have grown. So I invited Anita, and this is my third child's fifth grade graduation. So Anita is not the first white teacher I have invited to my home. However, she is the first. So guess what? When I gave that invitation, did I expect Anita to show up? No. <laughs> Anita had an assistant who was Hispanic, and I don't know if we can say his name or not, but anyways, I did expect him to show up. Why? He because lived, he lived yeah. in the hood with us. Like I said, the school is in the hood. She worked in the hood. But I didn't expect her to come because other teachers work there too. And um, so we're, we're planning. I'm in the kitchen doing me, making these beautiful trays. And all of a sudden, I hear kids saying, the white people are coming. The white people are coming. <laughs> I'm like, so I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> Somebody done call human services. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, now I'm panicking because human services coming. I, I got all these kids here. Is there a racial, you know, oh my God, I'm going to get in trouble. And Anita comes in, hi, Tiff. You need some help? I'm like, Anita, what are you doing? Oh, it, she man. said on the invitation, 1 o'clock. Uh, it, it's like 1.15. I was there at 1.15. I'm like, OK, OK, hold on. OK, we're just going to take all this food outside. So we're taking the food outside and everything. And all of a sudden, Mr. D, Mr. D. And I'm like, what? The, who is Mr. D? <laughs> all the kids know Anita's husband. All the kids run it. This was our teacher from Jane's school. And, um, he so, also subbed during the time he wasn't working, I was like, so he made some So I'm, I'm paying attention, like, okay, the kids know Mr. D. Uh, my husband, he liked the Mr. Drink. <laughs> <laughs> so it's time to bless the food. And I'm like, okay, Mr. D, Brother Lou, can I get you to bless the food? Okay, so <laughs> my husband, I love him. He is, like, just an amazing guy. I love him, too. But, <laughs> but, and he always says, how much of a jerk do you make me look like in these things? <laughs> He's standing there. He is already so far out of his comfort zone. Like Tiff said, I work in the hood. I'm with these kids all the time. This is not Lou's world. So he's been, and, and praying in public is not Lou's thing, even if we were with our own group of friends, you know. <gasps> so he said, she said, she said, Brother Lou, and he goes, am I Brother Lou? You're a brother? Yeah. He goes, I'm a brother. No, I'm not a brother. OK. So she, and everybody's looking at him, I swear. And there's 110 kids at this. And they're all going crazy until she says Just picture this, this room. Just look around the room. This is the party. A whole stopped. bunch of black kids. No parents. <laughs> everybody stops to hear Brother Lou. And he was just like. So I said, 
just say the one we say before every meal. And so, I don't know if you, any Catholics in here, we say, bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts, <laughs> which we are about to receive. From thy bounty through Christ our Lord, amen. Slow and that's about how fast they you need say to hit it. it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so he says amen. And, and I'm looking, and the kids are ready to eat. I'm like, hold up. Hold up. <laughs> Was that the quicker picker upper? Because all I heard was bounty. All I heard was bounty. <laughs> the quicker picker upper. And I was like, them kids wanted Lou to pray every day. Because in our house, we would have had to thank the Lord for Anita and her children showing up. We had to thank for Tom. Thank, thank you, Lord, for Lydia. Thank you for Megan. Thank you for Sammy. Thank you for Mr. D. You know, we thank God for everything before we touch that food. Them kids were so excited to me. I couldn't even, you know, and, and my nephew always say, Auntie Tiffany, you can't pray behind the prayer. Be <laughs> That's what they said. They said, Brother Lewis said it right. right. We're eating. <laughs> they was like, he said, amen. <laughs> God heard him. Uh, they were like, I'm sorry if you didn't hear what he said. God heard him. So we, <laughs> we let everyone eat. And then you want to tell why you love your son. You what? have to read the rest of the book to see how the party went. It's in the book. <laughs> There's other yeah. funny stuff. Yeah, but we'll, we'll, we'll let you Related about roughly it. to our whiteness and their blackness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna take a little public service announcement very quickly to say that if I didn't have the basis and behavior to feel confident that I could handle Oscar, then I couldn't have done the other steps because it was that knowledge that whatever Oscar did in my classroom, I was gonna be able to handle that helped me to say that to Tiffany and that helped to build that trust, just truly having that skill. So I want to make a little plug for people to start thinking about this, that all schools and classrooms have to have this in place. It's what helped Oscar to go from a very, very troubled little boy to a really excelling little boy in one school year's time. That's not a lot of time. So good intentions are not enough and understanding that they're coming from another culture in my opinion is not enough we really have to have some high quality interventions that are based on the science behind behavior because these kids come to us as behavior is the primary issue if the behavior wasn't in the way we could we could reach the academics we could get to the academics but the behavior is the barrier and i like to think of things as What's in the way of this child? That's how I looked at my call with Tiffany. What's in the way of this child doing what he can do? The first thing that's in the way is he's got a reduced schedule. The second thing is that he thinks he can run home. We need to fix those two things before we can do anything else. So as much as we want good intentions and the right spirit and the right notion to be enough, because that's hard enough, right? To keep that in mind is hard enough when you're kind of struggling against your own perceptions, but it's not. So without that piece, none of the rest of our story could have happened. So I really right. feel like that's important. We might have become friends, but Oscar would not have been successful. And I think it's less likely that we would have become friends because I would have had to have some more negative conversations with her than the positive ones I was able to have. So that's my plug. Um, so because of those behaviors and those issues that are typical to the parent-teacher relationship, we're looking at a legacy, and the legacy is not a good one. When you're looking at kids who are coming in with serious behavior issues, or even not a lot of behavior issues, but other issues related to poverty and, and things like that, then you're looking at a legacy. You are representing all those teachers behind you, and this mama is representing all those mamas behind her. Do you guys get what I'm saying about that? So I want to have a little conversation about that. And Tiffany's going to help us with the mom side. Yes. Um, but what are some of the things that you went through as a mom? Try one word. Stress. Stress. And, and let's talk about as a result of your communications and your interactions with the schools. Well, like I said, the schools, I didn't feel like they wanted to help my son. Um, diagnosing him, the teachers diagnosing him, did not help the problem, it created a bigger problem. Okay, so. Um, but at the end of the day, stress was dealing with a child that was diagnosed as a behavior child, dealing with what they said at him at school. So 
when the teacher called and said, your son was doing this at school, and I know he don't act like that at home. It, it changed me and my son's relationship because either you're lying on this, and I grew up, I don't know, some of y'all grew up, we couldn't call white people liars. I mean, not white people, but grown people. But the, most of the time, it was them folks. Uh, and so when my son is saying, Mama, but I didn't do this, Okay, so you're talking about trust. It was, it was, it was. I'm just trying to get one more yes. thing. So, yeah. with a, a tip, that's hard. Um, so you're so. saying stress and confusion is what I heard in the second piece that you were talking about. Right. Confusion about kind of what they're saying about him. Um, and then trust, and that's one of the things that you've talked about is um, broken trust because people will say they're gonna do one thing and they don't do it. And especially in your IEPs especially when you're writing your individual program. We're gonna do this. We're gonna work on these goals. And it look good on the IEP, it look good on paper, just like a resume. But when you get to meet that person, <laughs> something else. So, and then there were times where you felt you were treated how? There were times where I, I felt I was looked down on. Um, I was, I, I feel like they didn't wanna hear what I had to say. Because what I was saying was not matching their paper. It wasn't matching what they heard prior to me coming to this meeting. And um, I need, I'm just throw this in. So I got a little 4K, little daughter that's in 4K. And they wanted me to have a meeting because my daughter, she didn't know her colors and she didn't know this and that. So when the teacher was telling me, well, Christine doesn't know her colors. I was like, Christine, what color is this? Pink because that's my favorite color, so I had on pink. I said, what color is your coat? She said, purple. Me, touch the ground. What color is this? It's green. Well, what is that, Christine? That's grass. What color is this blue? Now, the teacher is witnessing this. So she should have been taking an observation that outside of class, Christine did an excellent job. That didn't happen. The morning I was supposed to meet with these people, Several people, I don't know their titles, had met with Christine. What is your mommy like? What does your mommy do? Because guess what? Our kids gonna tell us what y'all said and what you asked. <laughs> but because I went down this road before, I have a, a board at home and I had Christine do her work and I'm got my video, I'm videoing so they know it's not me doing the work, Christine's doing this. And I said, before we get started in this meeting, None of you know me, and I don't know none of y'all. I know this child right here, and that's who I'll be representing today, my child. So, like I said, it taught me a lot. I went from being stressed to being blessed, knowing what to do, when to do it, how to say it. So what did you do differently with Christine than, than what you had been doing with Oscar? Well, what I did differently with Christine is I put on a happy face. <laughs> I calmed down, I lowered my voice, and I had supporting evidence that my child can do the work. But does your average black mama have that? No, no, not where I'm from, not where my kids from. Yeah, that's what I mean, fact, the group that we're, <clears throat> that we're talking about. Yeah, so some of, the, some of my sisters, they, they may look down on me. And I'm like, y'all don't look down on me. I'm the one who went to jail for all of y'all because the social worker at the school where me and Anita met, I, during my pregnancy, I had to stay in the hospital. So my kids were at school every single day, but they were late. You know why? My husband had a job and my kids that had graduated from high school didn't have to get up for school, so they got up when they wanted to, they took the kids to school. So what happens is when you're doing your best, this lady was supposed to reach out to me. She was supposed to send me a certified letter. She was supposed to visit my home. She did none of that, but you know what she did do? She watched the computer every day to see had I been arrested. And honest to goodness, she was at my court date and the judge said anybody who's not on this paper had to leave. So we really have to find out, is our goal to work with these families and keep families together? Or, you know, we really have to know as educators, why are we teaching? So 
so Tiff, you've shared that you, you did get in trouble with the law and yeah. that that's been a, a worry. And also in other times that we've talked, Tiff had shared that um, a lot of times the families that we're going to work with and we're trying to talk to and are trying to connect with are really afraid of us because we bring a threat. And one of the threats is some sort of legal trouble, especially um, having your kids taken away, yes. right? Yes. So think of the intensity of that fear. That's part of what was going on in Tiffany's mind when the kids were all saying, the white people are here, the white people are here. Because that's her knee-jerk reaction is, am I in trouble? Can they do something to me? Can they hurt me? Can they hurt my family? Can they, you know, what am I going to have to do to make them understand? Um, and that's something that we need to really recognize and start changing the legacy of so that we can start building a different legacy, a better one. So, but it's not, it's a two-way street. And so what Tiffany's been really good at doing is starting to tell her friends who maybe come from that more knee-jerk, angry, frustrated, rightly so, background, she's been able to tell them, here's another way. Not, not back down, because trust me, Tiffany does not back down. Mm -mm. <laughs> I pity the fool who gets in her way. <laughs> um, but she's been able to start coaching both sides of the equation for a healthier way to dialogue and, and to break out of that. And that, for me, I see other teachers who are very well-intentioned, but they're afraid too. Do you know what they're afraid of? Can anybody guess what the teachers are afraid of? When you're looking at um, dealing with a parent who's from a, another culture and another um, economic background, who's got some, a special needs kid, can you think of any of the things that a teacher might be afraid of? Tell the truth. Being called a racist. Being called a racist, number one. Nobody wants to be called that. Um, when you're, like you're afraid that they will think you're judging them. Right. How do I do this without tripping up in a politically correct world? How do I honestly dialogue with this genuine person who has the same goals that I do? We are, there is a huge barrier there, and that barrier is fear on both sides. Fear of we're going to give you a ticket, we're going to put you in jail, or we're going to take your kids away, and fear of we're going to take your, because if it goes to the extreme and you're a teacher, what do you lose? Your job. So there are two extremes of fear that we really have to openly recognize and start working to address. Does that mean that people should sit in IEPs and be careless about how they speak? They really, that's <coughs> ridiculous, you wouldn't do that with anybody. You would always choose your words carefully. But what I'm submitting is that we need to speak to the person about the problem in honesty and openness. And if you're not sure that what you're about to say will be misconstrued, say that. You can say that. It is so diffusing to say, friend. <laughs> I call to friend all the time. A yes. reminder, she is my friend. Um, <laughs> in case you forget. Yeah. I will say, all right, we got to tell this story now. I don't okay. know where it goes. I know we're way off. Okay. Okay. So do you know which story I mean? No, but go ahead, because all of them are good. <laughs> all right. So we're going to talk about, about a real time where our real cultures clashed, and I didn't have any choice but to tell her that. So my sweet little boy, Oscar, had grown. He was in high school. And my very religious friend was not happy with him. So she went to church. But did she listen to the preacher? No. She got her Bible out. This woman knows her Bible backward and forward. She can quote every scripture under the sun for whatever purpose it suits her. Trust me, I've seen her work it both ways. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And she's looking in church. She's looking. I'm not going to listen to the preacher. I'm going to find this verse that says I can beat Oscar. And I know it's in here. And she's looking and she's looking. Proverbs 18, 24. <laughs> she knows it now. <laughs> yes. So she, well, you can finish the story. So I, I, I'm upset. And I, I'm like, I'm going to jail. Today I'm going to jail. I'm going to jail. I'm going to jail. But when I go to jail, Lord Jesus, I need to tell the judge. If you love your child, you will beat.
meet him and deliver his soul from hell. I need to be able to tell the judge that, but Lord, it ain't coming to me. I know it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. The Bible said, beat your child. <laughs> beat him that. good. <laughs> and um, so I call, I call my dad and I'm like, you know, dad, Oscar, he, he, he just, uh, he just ain't acting right and he's not doing right and I just need to beat him. And my dad's like, hey, if you ain't did it in 16 years, if he don't know better in 16 years, if he do not know better by the time he's 16, you ain't got no business as a woman trying to hit that boy. I ain't trying to hear dad, by dad, Anita. <laughs> she goes back Hi, for another Anita. night she's looking through her Bible, still can't find it. No, now listen. Hi, Anita, this is Tiffany. <laughs> Were you busy? No, I'm at Tom's practice just doing a crossword puzzle. What's up? Girl, Oscar, you know, <laughs> gotta get me now. I had to make sure she was cool. Um, girl, Oscar is cutting up. Anita, I couldn't even listen to the preacher. I just need to beat him. I know you say there are no bad kids, but he is bad. He's B-A-D. <laughs> he put the B in bad. He's bad, and I need to whoop him because he needs to know better. Tiff, talk to the football coach. No, first I said. Oh, there are no bad kids. Because you couldn't hear me. There are no bad no. kids. She starts talking, and she's going a mile a minute like she does. And she could not hear me because I was being polite, as I was raised to do. And I'm like, Tiff, Tiff, if you couldn't find it, you probably, and all of a sudden I went, Tiffany, <laughs> shut up and listen to me. You cannot beat that boy. And she said, why the not. <laughs> yeah. We are a fresh level now. Because it won't work for one thing. And for another thing, it's not right. I don't care that it's because she's like, my daddy and my this and my. I don't care. And I had to tell her that. I get that it's part of your culture, but not everything that's a part of my. Food's a part of my culture. Food is love. We eat all the time. That's not a good thing. <laughs> tell me, I know it won't hurt my feelings. What I had to tell Tiffany that day was you cannot beat this boy. It's not going to help, and I don't care if you're mad at me for saying it, and I don't care that it's part of your culture because you're copping out, and there's a better way to take care of this young man than what you're talking about doing. Now, call his football coach. Call the football coach, and that was the most embarrassed. You know what? Oscar was so <laughs> embarrassed that I told the coach that was worse than any whooping I could have gave him. <laughs> and he uses that today with my younger kids. He don't touch them. He just say, I'm disappointed in the decision that you made. And oh my God, you should have, they would have rather took that whooping. But on the same point of being disappointed, one of the things Anita husband would always say to Oscar is, I expect great things from you. I expect great things from you. So even, you know, now it's, we expect great things from our children. And um, like I said, I got five babies at home. They're doing good in school with the teachers, the rapport between the teachers, everything. Can't wait so for kindergarten to start. <laughs> so pray for my baby's kindergarten but teacher. <laughs> I would not have said that I would not have said that to her if she was as aggressively as I did if she was still a parent in, of a student in my class. Obviously I need to, you know, follow some professional protocol. But I think the point is I hope the point is well taken that we can be genuinely honest and we can sort of deflect that hurt if we're careful not to not say what we need to say, but to say honestly, I'm gonna tell you something and I hope you take it the right way. Mm -hmm. And because it's only meant as, as help for your kid. And one of the things I always repeat with my, my parents all year long is if we partner, we can do this. We, 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 not I and not you. If we partner, we can do this. And that's very affirming. But I do want us to remember that there's two sides of that coin. There is the mom, the frustrated mom who's afraid of her child being taken away or getting a ticket or going to jail. And there's that teacher who's afraid of doing some, something politically incorrect, losing their job, um, or hurting some. Honestly, my, one of my biggest fears, I cannot tell you how many times while we were writing this book, because we had to be honest about my impressions of Tiffany's world. That's mm -hmm. a scary, that's a terrifying thing to do. Because honestly, I'm a nice person. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I don't want to judge anybody. I don't want to demean anybody. But when we started talking about maybe we have something to share, mm -hmm. I had to tell her some truths about my perception or we couldn't have done it. So mm -hmm. it is terrifying. It's a scary thing to do. What did you want to say to I her? wanted to say, um, 
because you know, she told you I'm going to school to be a teacher, and I love acronyms. So fear is false evidence appearing real. Go ahead, check that out. I'm waiting. Oh, I'll write. I <laughs> no, was I'll write it. I'll write it. I'll write it. You keep, yeah. you keep so talking for. When, when we have that fear of meeting the ghetto, well, Anita, did you tell them that? What? That they told you I was ghetto. You know, they really tried to put a fear in this woman about who I was. And it was false I evidence. did not tell them that. You mean when oh, we, before? Get some, it's in the book. <laughs> <laughs> false evidence appearing real. And so okay. it's like when we, you know, like I said, we, we stressed, we confused, we don't know how to trust y'all. And then y'all don't even know we have these feelings. So you trying to teach us and but when we can overcome that fear and say, hey, this ain't how it is. Not all white teachers are this way. We see that. Not all black mamas are this way. You see that. And what we have to know is people are people, no matter what color. You treat me with respect. As a black mama, I don't care how ghetto I am. I was raised with respect. I had a big mama. And we'll reflect to that. You see what I'm saying? But if you get out of pocket, Remember, I had a big mama, and when we got out of pocket, grandma showed her tail and got ours. And so that's another thing in my book. I asked my black sisters, my people in my community, to go back to the white teacher and let them know I apologize, not for myself, but for my race, because that's not who we are. We are not the ghetto black mama. We are the lioness who are roaring, and you guys missed it because we will protect our cubs at all costs. And who can blame you, right? That's who I am. That's I am not say. a ghetto mama, never. Right. And, and like I said, the ghetto mamas look at, and they be like, for real? She ain't never did a drug in her life. She don't know what it's like to drink until I met Anita. <laughs> that is so true. You, but you now see what I'm on saying? Facebook, every other day, she's making this cocktail and that cocktail. I still ain't drinking. I, I got I to gotta <laughs> tell y'all, um, eight, eighth grade health class, we were getting ready to go to high school. My health teacher said, I'm going to teach you guys how to be cool being cool. He said, next year, you're going to be in high school. You're going to be invited to all the parties. He said, what I want you to do is get you a can of beer. Get your can of beer, go to the bathroom, pour out the beer, fill it with water. Be cool, being cool. I teach it in Sunday school. I teach it everywhere <laughs> I go. Be cool, being cool. She never but taught me that. when you get around Anita, and you got to drink a margarita. It rhymes. <sighs> um, all right, so we have a lot of fun together. Yes, we do. Uh, and all right, so good. we need to, so getting back on track, but yeah, yeah, I know you love your being cool story. Yeah. It's, um, it's, I'm just teaching them to teach them. <laughs> So we want to make sure that we see all parents as wanting their child to succeed because honestly, I believe this is true. And I'm going to share a story with you um, that it just really gets to me. I had this little girl, this was before I met, after I met you. Um, I had this little girl who was very severely behavioral, really a, a tough little case, wonderful little girl, but she had a lot of problems. She had suffered abuse and trauma and neglect for her entire developmental time. So she was coming to me really rough. And we were doing all our behavior stuff and we were making some progress with her, but her mental health issues were so severe that we were struggling to get the traction I usually get. Um, and we had this bad day, this really bad day, where this little girl hit me, kicked me, scratched me. I had to restrain her for a long period of time. And because I had to do a restraint, I had to let her mother know. So I called her mom and I told her, and this is a parent like all my other parents who I have cultivated a relationship with. I was working to be a partner with her, even though she really had some delays herself. I still wanted to do the best I could do with her. So I called her and I told her what had happened. And I said, you know, tomorrow's a new day. That's always my philosophy. I never carry over a, a behavior consequence from the day before. Um, so the little girl came in. We we're having our next day. She said, Mrs. D, can I sit by you? And I said, sure. So she came and ate her breakfast up by me by my desk. And I could just tell she was feeling bad and she wanted to be near me. So she was sitting near me and her face, I'm gonna try to say this without crying. Her face was this way, I just could see one side of her face. And then she turned around to tell something to somebody in the class and I could see whip marks from here in her braids, I could see it, down her face, down her neck, 
and I almost threw up, literally almost threw up, because I knew the second I saw that, that those were my fault, because I had told mom what had happened. And I was also sick because I knew in her own misunderstanding way, mom might have thought she was helping me. That day, we had to call the police. I've never had a child removed from school and home as a result of a visit like that. But the rest of her injuries were severe enough that they needed to take her to the hospital and they needed to not have her in the home and they needed to get all of the other kids out of the home. So instantly, it went to this big, another trauma for this little girl. And I was so sick that I had, that she was living this life, but also that I had played a part in it. And I was just devastated. So we went through that day and the kids were all removed. And about two weeks later, we were about to have our, our conferences. And I got a phone call and the phone call was from this little girl's mom. And she said, Mrs. D, I want to come see you. You will not be surprised to know I was afraid. She was very much gang affiliated. She was very rough. She had been in and out of jail. She was not sounding happy. I had all her babies taken away in her mind. So I was very afraid. That's the honest truth. I'm not going to stand up here and say I was, I was scared. But I thought about it and I thought, she didn't say anything threatening. And of course she's upset. Who wouldn't be upset? So let me pause. And I try to put that word in my head a lot. Let me pause. And I thought, how can I be safe, but also open? And so I told the teacher next door, I have a mom coming in, I give her all the details. I'm very careful about that. And I, that's another thing I'd like to caution teachers, not to talk about our friends and their realities, except when it needs to be done. I see a lot of people sort of getting some self-gratification out of sharing this story. And to me, I'm the opposite. It's like, we close it down, we don't tell anybody, because I don't want anybody getting any satisfaction out of sort of hearing this juicy story, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So I just told my partner, if you hear anything, just call the principal. You don't need to come over, just call the principal. And I didn't say anything else, but I was scared. So I sat there at my desk and she came in as she had planned, you know, scheduled to do, which was a step in the right direction for her. And she sat down and she would not look at me. She sat like this, which made me so sad. And she said, Mrs. D. She said, I know I did wrong. I know I did wrong. But I was so mad. You're the first teacher who ever wanted to help her. And she hit you and I was so mad. And I just, I, I don't want her hitting you. I don't want her acting like that for you. I don't want her doing that in school. And she's still looking down and she said, you know, I was 14 when I had her. And I was in a class just like this when I was a kid. She said, I don't know what I'm doing. She's still not looking at me. And then all, when she did look at me, she looked up, she looked me right in the eye and she said, will you help me? And I just, my heart was breaking. It was breaking for the whole situation. And I told her I would help her in any way I could. But the sad truth is, there was little I could do for her. Except that one moment where I wasn't judging her. I keep telling myself maybe that was something for her. And I know it was something for her little girl. And I was able to keep that child in my class for two and a half more years, and we saw really good progress. But the reason for that story is not to make you all so sad. You look so sad now. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really to tell you that some of our toughest, roughest, meanest, most angry parents are hurt little kids. And that's a facade. And we have to kind of remember that. Now, I don't want to say that we have to make excuses for that because that's the opposite end of the coin right okay that's we right. feel very very bad for her but we cannot excuse away what she did it was wrong mm -hmm. and we cannot pretend like that can go on we have to find a way to fix it and so we'll talk more about some of those expectations so that's part of that story is trying to get us to kind of see things from their perspective it's an extreme case but there are all sorts of cases you know that are less extreme but that still need to be taken into account and Tiffany, you were talking about speaking clearly and honestly in IEPs. Right. And I think part of that is we are so worried about political correctness that we're not saying the words that the parent needs to hear. And did you want to say more on that? Well, that's what I'm saying. So when, when we are talking, even if it's not an IEP, simple parent-teacher conference, um, <laughs> my, my babies, all my girls, except for my baby girl, when they entered uh, 4K in kindergarten, 
the teacher made the mistake of asking my girls, do you want to teach the class? They said, yes. <laughs> and my, my Jacoby, she had a Hispanic teacher. And she said, Jacoby, if you think you could do a better job, would you like to teach the class? And Jacoby said, yes, I'd like to teach the class. It is not our, it's our. <laughs> and she said, when they're in the housekeeping area, Jacoby always correct the kids and tell them to clean things. So we get to the teacher's conference, right? Jacoby, five years old, no, she was 4K, four years old. Before the teacher, the teacher pulled out the folder, before she could even talk, Jacoby was going, I was like, oh my goodness. So sometimes when you guys are being honest, saying, hey, your child is doing this or doing that, and it was so funny because she's describing me. She's, this teacher is describing me, right? Because, Jacob, girl, you don't get out, your, get out my kitchen without washing your hands. You know, she was just being me. <laughs> and, and, and so I'm at the, so be real careful to be honest because a parent, like I said, you know your child. And when, there, when she was telling me this, all this Jacoby was doing, before she could, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with make and takes. They, they may put the alphabet on a piece of paper and then they take out little alphabets. So before she could even tell me about it, Jacoby's like, mom, this is a make and take. When we leave here today, we're gonna take it. Four years old. I mean, well, no, she had turned five because her birthday's in September. So she was probably five by now. But it was like, Jacoby, this is really rude. You're being rude. And so I told her, I said, look, this teacher went to school to teach, and you have to let her do her job. So the next year when she got to uh, kindergarten, her teacher said, you know, I asked Jacoby if she'd like to teach the class, and her eyes got so big. I said, did she say yes? She said, she, her eyes got big, like, if I say yes, I'm gonna get a whooping. <laughs> <laughs> like, you're gonna tell my mom I wanted to teach her class and then I'm gonna be in trouble. But um, yeah, so when teachers are talking to parents, just remember, we're human. And like I said, you can tell, sometimes you can look at a person, if I'm stressed, watch for facial expressions. Because I'm, I'm gonna say this, if black or white, if a parent shows up to a conference, whether it's an IEP or a parent-teacher conference, they're concerned, if they show up. Because like before I met Anita, I told Anita, I said, Anita, I wasn't always this nice when it came to teachers. And you'll hear time and time again, and this is fifth grade. This is fifth grade. So we put our kid in kindergarten at five years old. And then by the time they get to Anita, we finally get a good teacher. <laughs> but um. Yeah, so just remember, if they even show up for a conference, they care. And they care and they have feelings. And I think that's a good place to start, you know, if, if you get that connection or even if you have to manufacture that connection with an individual conference or a phone call, that's a good place to start. Um, but the other thing that I want to keep in mind when we're talking about sort of understanding where they're coming from and understanding the conditions that they live in and understanding this and that, the other thing I want to keep in mind is the fact that we can't say that those are excuses for diminishing our expectations of any child, any color. We just can't. We can't say because you have a hard life, we're going to make it a whole lot harder but not de by not demanding that you know what you need to know. So when Oscar was in my class, one of the only behaviors that he, he clung to almost to the end of the year was he would lose it whenever I would make him write. He hated the physical act of writing. He hated the conceptual part of writing. He hated writing. But he would always tell me, I'm going to go to college. I'm going to go to college. And I said, listen, friend, if you want to go to college, you've got to be able to write. So I told him, if you, I'm going to teach you first how to write a good sentence. This is fifth grade. He's that far behind. I said, when I can teach you how to write a good sentence, then I can show you how to write a good paragraph. And we're going to do that. Before the end of this year, we're going to do that. Then I said, once you can write a good paragraph, I'm going to show you how to write a good essay. We'll get that done before the end of the year, too. You're going to be able to write a good essay. And if, as a fifth grader, you leave here understanding how to construct a sentence, a paragraph, and an essay, I firmly believe you can write a paper. Because a paper is just a whole bunch of those, right? So I told him, this is why we're going to work on this. So when he would get mad at me, I would say, but you can't do college without knowing how to write. And years later, Read the story in the book. It's a great story about him going off to college. When he went off to college, he came back. He had a medical problem. And he was in the hospital. I was visiting him. He was a little bit on morphine. 
but I still take it as a huge compliment because he said, Mrs. D, you know, I was one of the kids who could write the best in college because you kept telling me if I could do this, this, and this, then I could do that. And you showed me how to do this, this, and this, and I felt it was my job to do that. Can I just add this? Of course. While all his other college students had written many, many essays, it took him two weeks to write his first one, but that was the first time he had ever had an opportunity, even through high school, to write it. And he was like, Mom, Quantum, just zoom right through it. But he had to have what that teacher said, write this first sentence, write this paragraph. He had to teach himself, and he had to do his own proofreading. He had to do it all because he had never had anyone correct him. So and that's one thing that Tiffany and I learned through the process of writing the book and some of our public speaking experiences. We had um, these two girls. We, it's so hard to even explain this story, but we ended up practicing our first public speaking appearance in my living room with my husband and my sister and two homeless girls, because why not? And these, these girls were just so sweet, and they're sitting there quietly feeling very uncomfortable being at the white people's house. They didn't know they were going there. Tiffany said, if you want to ride from church, this is where we're stopping. Didn't tell them we'd be there for five hours. <laughs> so these poor little hungry homeless girls are sitting on my couch in my living room, and my husband's like timing us, and my sister's giving us advice. She's an educator, too. And I'm telling a story. I think I was telling the story about Oscar and his, right? Okay. And uh, he said, I'm telling the story, and I'm talking about writing, and, and I'm talking about, I think the Stasia story was in there too, and I yeah. look over and I see Lovely. Her name fits her, just prettiest little thing. And she's just got, I've just met this girl, I haven't known her for more than 15 minutes, she just has tears streaming down her face. So I'm like, Lou, stop the timer. Jen, stop taking notes. Tiff, we're gonna stop there. I said, Lovely, I'm not gonna go on until I know what's going on with you, because I, I can see this is hurting you, and I don't wanna keep going without acknowledging that and finding out what we can do about it. And she just sobbed and she said, you're talking about me. That's me you're talking about. She was a senior at the time. And she said, they don't care how good my paper is as long as I hand it in. They're so happy, and these were her words, not mine. She That's said, they're right. so happy the black girl wrote a paper, they don't take too close a look at it. And, and she was just so hurt by that. Like, why don't I deserve a little more attention and a little more support. She has goals too. So we, we ended up speaking through that and talking with her and getting to know her and now she's a big part of my life and um, she's a very important part of my life and she's helping me to see the sort of the damage that we're doing when we underestimate what our kids from every single walk of life can do and that is not fair to anybody and it's almost we have to be harder on those kids who are behind, right? We have to be a little tougher on those kids but we can be tough and loving at the same time. Can um, I say something about Lovely? Yeah. Um, when she graduated, you're only given four tickets. Anita and I had um, the two of them. So that says a lot about the impact Anita as a teacher, who wasn't even her teacher, but me as a Sunday school teacher, um, just being in her life. And what happened is I asked Anita, I said, hey, do you mind if I bring two girls with me? And Anita was thinking girls like our age. I was thinking and, church ladies. And so when we got, and I'm, explaining, and I'm explaining to my girls, like, look, when we get here, this is how, look, don't, don't come in here talking about the white people. Lovely. It's so, I'm like, don't be doing that. You know, <laughs> don't talk about no Republicans. Don't talk about nothing. <laughs> don't be talking about how much you love Obama. Don't do that. <laughs> and then they're like, Tiff, we're not, we got to Anita. And I got to tell y'all this, because, you know, we are a royal priesthood of Queens. Anita lives on Queens Court. So she, she's one of my queens, I don't know. Yep. She, um, and so we get to Queen's Court, about and they're else. like, uh, okay, so they're like, we're not getting out. We're not, we're not going in here. They, she, they like, no, nah, Tiff. We they would not was, get out of the van. They thought I was taking her to some white people's house that's cool, like they listen to rap music. I'm cool. They, they, they knew when, when they seen the neighborhood, mm -mm, these ain't the white people we want to know. So Anita's sister is a teacher too. She's also crazy. She went to my car and started singing. She jumped in their van, <laughs> scared the heck out of these two little girls who were trying just to hide while we did our thing. Just and hide then, in this van. Jenny rips the door open. She's got her, she's got a weird phone case. She's got, she's got her phone. She jumps in and she's like, starts singing all the single ladies. And the girls are like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> and she said, my sister can't do what she needs to do knowing that there are kids sitting out in the car right now. So you're going to have to come in the house. And so they did. 
So yeah. that's not in the book. Look for the sequel. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. So uh, also, we want to encourage these kids, and we want to be um, creative in how we do that. So when we're first reaching out to, to kids, it's important to find what they can do. And when I speak about behavior, I speak about this a lot. Find where they are and what they can do and what grips them and what gets them, and then build on that. So I had this little boy who was in Oscar's class, actually, and he also hated writing. They all did, and, but he loved art. And I said, well, listen, if you write your essay about a famous artist, then I will help you recreate a famous work of art. Well, he was like, no, you won't. How are you going to do that? So I said, trust me, we'll do it. We'll make this happen. You just have to pick an artist, and you have to write a good essay about this artist. So we picked Vincent van Gogh. And after a few days of researching and doing stuff you know, with the help of the assistant and me, he's making his notes and stuff, and he's reading, and he's bringing books home. And he's, he's actually bringing them back, which was really cool. Um, he came up to me, and he goes, Mrs. D, you know Vincent van Gogh? I said, yeah. He goes, you know he had a troubled heart? And I said, yeah. And he goes, I got a troubled heart, too. Oh. And I was like, OK. And he said, that's who I'm writing about. Will you help me do one of his works of art? So I told him I would. And for two months, we worked. I don't know how many of you know Vincent van Gogh, but he's one of my faves. He, Eddie and I worked every day for about two months to recreate this work of art, which I still think is amazing. Wow. If you that's know great. the original, this little boy painted this with temper paint and a poster board. Imagine what he could do with good art supplies and more encouragement from a teacher who actually knows stuff because I didn't know much about how to paint, but I knew, I knew enough to get us through. The point of that is that there are kids like that sitting in all of our classes with just this little nugget and that if we facilitate something with that little nugget, we can start building some of those harder things for them to do on that little capacity and create a great capacity. The sad thing about this is, first of all, the good thing was it was at the open house. Everybody saw it. All these teachers who used to see this kid one way started seeing this kid another way. But this little boy, at the end of the year, I said, here, you need to take your painting home. It was almost the end of the year. And he said, no, Ms. D, I can't take that home. I said, well, it's yours. You need to take it home. It's beautiful. You should have it. He said, no, I can't have that at home. He said, if I take it home, the next time we get evicted, it'll be gone. So my husband came in, and this was way back when you know, digital cameras were new. He, he got a digital cam camera. He came in, he took a really nice picture of it and put it in a frame. Because what, what he had told me was, as it, the only things I get to keep are what I can fit in my backpack. And so I told my, husband, my family that at dinner. And so Lou came in, he took a picture, and he put it in a small frame so that he could keep it in his backpack. I don't know if this little boy still has that picture, but. You know, to me, I just hope he does. And if he doesn't, I know he has it, at least in his memory, that he was able to do this. So um, that's, excuse me, that's one good way of showing your parents that you value the child and that their, val their child is valuable. Um, these, these little things are just how to build that trust. And there's things that we've already talked about starting right away, right at the beginning of the year, before you even have to have a cause to say something negative. Get in there and say something positive. And set that, use that language of we and partnership, because that matters a lot to every parent. It doesn't matter what, where they're coming from. Um, see the child and his and her abilities and assets first. Set high expectations. And remember, you're trying very hard to correct a legacy and start a new and very positive legacy. And I'm happy to say that honestly, and I always get choked up at this part, in my life, I've never had a friend like Tiffany. Oh, hug moment. <laughs> She's a pain in the back. <laughs> yes. Thank you, guys. Read the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much.